Would you turn with me? Thank you, friend. To page 48, recommendation number six. Resolution for a regional missional support of in the trial advance special. Bishop, I move the adoption of. Right, thank you so much. It's properly before us from our agenda committee. And uh, thanks, Brother Cooper. Bishop Palmer and members of the West Ohio Conference, as articulated a moment ago, please turn to page 48. Uh, early in the months, uh, a couple of years ago, as the director of the Council, and I was helping them to develop some strategies for sustainability. And we talked about stewardship, we talked about potential significant donors, we talked about grants, we talked about churches participating. And knowing that this was a priority in the West Ohio Conference, I asked, what about the Conference Advanced Special? How is that helping you? And I got this blank look. And I said, don't you know what a Conference Advanced Special is? And the person said to me, I've never heard of it. We don't have those. Well, I came from, uh, um, I used to be introduced by a previous bishop as having come from the dark side from the East Ohio Conference. <laughs> I'm glad you're here, Bishop Palmer. <laughs> I now have seen the light. <laughs> and, um, and so uh, West Ohio Conference, in my experience in the last two years, has some phenomenal and fantastic missional alignments for making in various regions of them. Communities are underfunded. This is renowned throughout the connection for its generosity to the advance. We heard that yesterday from George Howard. And Sunday after a workshop on funding the guy, <laughs> I made sure he understood it's not because I have money, <laughs> but it's because I'm willing to educate, train, coach, plan, strategize, invite, ask for the resources to achieve the mission and vision God has placed before us as the West Ohio Conference. I don't believe in scarcity. We have God that has created all the resources we need to accomplish mission and vision in the West Ohio Conference. I truly believe that. Amen. And as a result, it's a matter of how do we allow God to enable individuals that desire to be faithful to the call upon their lives to be generous in ways that perpetuates mission and vision within this annual conference so there need not be any mission or ministry that finds themselves underfunded. <coughs> I believe that research has demonstrated that giving follows vision and giving follows passion and how can in regional ministries to individuals to give second smile needs to be the tithes you hear me. Amen. The offerings of the tithes and offerings to the local church first. Anything we talk about in a few moments is second mile giving above and beyond. <coughs> And as local churches, we need to provide opportunities for churches that are excited about certain kinds of ministries and regions to have the opportunity to give to those after, after uh, as second mile giving. And this, that opportunity, but we need to first put a system in place across the annual conference called the Conference Advance Special you all can read, so I don't think I need to read that to you, but I want to emphasize a few um, pieces of the be it therefore resolved that. We asked the bishop to put together a task force that would then put together a team that would investigate what are the criteria for regional ministries, how can a regional ministry apply. This isn't a ministry for a local church, but for a region of a number of local churches, potentially. Yes. Advance of the denomination. They need to pursue their own fundraising initiatives, but we as an annual conference can say these are the conference advance specials that we encourage you to give in that steering committee that the uh, bishop do all of the development, application, the evaluation, the reporting, and bring those reports back to the um, connectional ministries and to the executive team of Let Justice Roll and to this annual conference before, and remember this is a trial to put the system in place 
and then we would come back after we've evaluated how well it works with a small number of advanced specials, and then we would determine whether this is something we would like to do together as an annual conference. Bishop, um, those are my remarks, and I turn it back to you, sir. All right. I'm sorry. Thank you, Brother George. Uh, dear friends, this is before us, and what conversation would you like to have about this pilot? All right, let's give it a whirl. We're on recommendation number six. If you will adopt it, you'll lift the hand now. Thank you, and if you oppose it, the same sign. Thanks so much. I don't know what sign that is. I think this little... If for, uh, I believe we are at um, recommendation. Greenway, get in, uh, and then wherever we are, if the House will allow the chair, we've got um, to treat as a, which is a presentation of the annual conference coming in to uh, be a part of a presentation on Imagine No Here and others from our conference. Um, with your blessing, uh, wherever we are, we'll, um, we'll move to that at that time. And uh, if we may, we may be well ahead um, at that particular, that particular point. One other quick announcement, just to um, make use of this time while Jocelyn is getting ready. Um, earlier today, you saw the DVD on the uh, Breakthrough Prayer Lab, and um, you members have them, and please uh, get one if you wish, and what it does is direct you uh, online that gives you deeper information about dates and ways to register and to be engaged in this opportunity. So thanks very much for your attention, and Sister Roper. As your coach, I want to report to you that you've done excellent work in these last two days. We are on our last recommendation. Good job. If y'all were from Freedom School, y'all know what to do. But we will leave you, we'll, we'll teach you that later. Uh, recommendation number seven is before you. It's a petition requesting conference education and conversation on the nature, role, authority, and interpretation of scripture. It is on page 50, page 50. Bishop, I move the adoption of this recommendation. All right, it's properly before us. Thank you. Brother Greenway. Good morning, Bishop Palmer. Good morning, friend. And we're, good morning, members of the annual conference. Um, one of the things that I know about myself is that I'm a person of strong convictions. Some of you know that about me as well. And you also may know that I'm often drawn to and energized by persons of equally strong, strong convictions that don't necessarily have to agree with mine. Over the years, I've learned a very important lesson. I'd like to invite Bishop Palmer to illustrate this lesson with me. Um, oh my. Do I need to stand? You do. Oh, okay. That'd be helpful. Bishop, what do you see? I see um, a United States quarter. You do? Uh -huh. So do I. Uh -huh. what, do you, what do you see? I see um, the head of a former president. That's right. I see tails. Okay. Who's right? Um, we're both right. That's right. We are. Yeah. See, the thing is, thank you very much, Bishop. That helps me a lot. <laughs> All right. So the thing is that we're both right. <laughs> And we need the perspective of the other to be able to see the whole of what's in front of us. Um, that's true in many things that face us in our lives. The greatest gift we have for each other are sometimes our differences from each other. We, who are many, all beloved, beautiful children of God, are all one body in Christ. However, sometimes we see things differently from a different perspective. Um, I know that there may be some suspicion in the body about this petition. I want to tell you there's no agenda here, none, except to help us deepen our community together. And we're asking our bishop to exercise the teaching office of the episcopacy to engage all of us in our different views of our common book so that we can, un we can understand each other, so that we can understand each other so well that we could make each other's case when we talk with one another, that we wouldn't talk past one another, but with one another, and we would grow in deepening our love with one another. That's all I have to say, Bishop. Thank you for this introduction. Let's have some conversation. Um, I don't, red, yellow, white. 
Red, blue, what? Okay, all right, let's try. Where do you, what's good for you? Okay, let's come to the front and uh, uh, Jocelyn, if you'd get this microphone off for Brother Fairchild. Let's make sure this uh, front mic is hot, friends. Bishop, I'd like to move by addition if that's in order. Uh, let's give it a try. Tell us where you are and tell us who you are. Uh, Daryl Fairchild, Miami Valley District. All right. And at uh, page 51, mm -hmm. line 17, after the word the, I'd like to add um, the inclusive body of Christ ministry team in consultation with the bishop and with necessary funding from the Connectional Ministry Executive Team. All right, is it supported? All right, I hear a second. Speak to it, friend. And re tell you what, repeat it one more time and then give us your, your uh, conversation. Yeah. Page 51, line 17, after the word the, insert inclusive body of Christ ministry team in consultation with the bishop and with necessary funding from the uh, connectional table executive team. I value God's authority, and when I think of God's authority, I'm thankful because I am mindful that I can be easily distracted and I can quickly wander where demons dwell. And it's God's authority that reigns me in and puts me on a safe path. And I believe we could all benefit from a deeper understanding of biblical authority, as well as God's authority and biblical literacy, as well as an understanding of how to responsibly teach about these things. Unfortunately, uh, while I'm eager to support this recommendation and its intent and spirit, I don't think this recommendation as written accomplishes its goal, for it doesn't respect authority. The discipline gives the bishop the authority and the responsibility to order our spiritual and temporal life. Now there have been occasions when I would like to tell a bishop what to do. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine. <laughs> but yesterday during the biblical lesson by uh, Dr. Robinson, and Bishop, thank you for that incredible gift of sharing her with us. Um, I realized that uh, I don't have that authority, nor does this body have that authority to tell the bishop what to do. Um, and so um, that... And I, and I would say, Bishop, that your time with us and the 12 years of your accomplished Episcopal leadership, you've demonstrated that you are more than able to exercise that authority in our midst. Thank you. Um, well, that went over big. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Brother Fairchild. I'll be quick. <laughs> so I invite the body here to assign this task to an appropriate ministry team that does have the authority to deal with this, uh, this task. Um, I think it will advance the intent of the recommendation, and I think it will respect the authority of the discipline and the office of the bishop. I ask you to support the amendment and then to support the recommendation, recommendation once amended. Thank you. All right. Uh, what conversation do you have on the Fairchild Amendment, and is it at the table yet? Yeah. All right. Great. Uh, there's a question by microphone three. Mm. Okay, Kathy Johns, Clergy, Ohio River Valley. Bishop, I'm not certain this is a question, so I want to be upfront about that. Um, it, it, it's a, it is a speech against his amendment, if you're ready for that. Yes, yeah, sure, go right ahead. Okay. If uh, um, you didn't have that card up, but let, you're there, come on, let's, let's hear right. from you. Yeah. Uh, Bishop, I serve as the chair of the Order of Elder on the Board of Redeemed Ministry, and look at this as an incredible opportunity. Uh, the way the amendment is originally presented for the orders, for the lady um, of our conference to gather for dialogue. As we know, sometimes these conversations are, are uh, passionate, 
and I'm with my friend Jeff, Brother Jeff. Um, I, I love those kinds of conversations, and we need to be able to trust one another to go to the Jabbok River and wrestle with God, wrestle with one another, and walk away blessed. I believe that we have the ability to do that, and I believe that is the intent of the original motion, so I speak against the amendment. Okay, thanks very much. And um, other thoughts? Just got a question card, oh, sort of near the door there. Yep, you, please stand, yep. And number eight is, oh, you're right there at eight. I couldn't see eight, but I could see you, okay. My name is Sarah Chapman. I'm a licensed local pastor in Ohio River Valley. I have a question about the amendment. Okay. Um, I was one of the people that when I originally read this resolution was a bit suspicious of it because it felt dangerous that one person's one viewpoint could dominate. And does this resolution speak to that by adding this connectional ministry, this team, would it um, make it very clear that this is meant to come together and have the bishop? Well, since you mentioned the bishop, um, <laughs> let, let me um, let me take this approach and see if it helps. And then, Brother Chairman, if you uh, want to speak to it, because you is is your question on the uh, main motion? Because I'm I'm a little um, it's mixed. the amendment. It's Will the, the amendment. amendment help ensure that? more viewpoints come to the table and are welcome rather than as it landed on me which felt a little bit like somebody's going to tell us the right way maybe i read it wrong but the way it landed is not this come to the table and discuss yeah and you're getting a little close to a speech in favor that's why i was trying and, to ask yeah, about yeah. the amendment i apologize let, let, let me say um since to the extent that you mentioned the office of bishop, as does the original motion, and also, um, by implication, the um, uh, and some explicitly the amendment. The way I have, let me say, there, there's nothing that ensures uh, would be my first response. Um, if if the if the attempt. Um, or the, or the inference that is taken, whether intended, is to um, guard um, against any direction that the bishop might go, um, that, that, that'll be what the House has to decide. Um, I took it, as I read the original, um, and the way it fleshed it out, that, um, that it was inviting me to craft this with people, take leadership in doing so, and um, it, as I read it, and, and again, this is not for or against, it explicitly talked about using a range of scholarly um, um, uh, minds or viewpoints um, within our uh, larger United Methodist family. So that's how I read it, um, thinking about you know, if, if there's work to be done after annual conference. Um, now, one thing I want to read to you is from the Book of Polity. I'm in paragraph 414, and, um, and the heading of the whole section is Specific Responsibilities of Bishops. Uh, 414.3 says, to guard, transmit, teach, and proclaim corporately and individually the apostolic faith as expressed in scripture and tradition and as they are led and endowed by the spirit to interpret the faith evangelically and prophetically. So I signed on to that at my consecration. It's what the whole church directs bishops to do. So through the book of discipline, I, and I don't have a vote at the general conference. 414 point 414.5 additionally says, and these are only the ones with specific reference to um, um, teaching in this section, to teach and uphold the theological traditions of the United Methodist Church. So that's the assignment that the church, in, in the broadest, most general sense, uh, to be applied in context, of course, has already given to every bishop, not just Palmer. 
So um, I, um, I, I take that with, uh, I want to say with earnestness, and that's the way and the lens through which I try to view it, um, and the lens through which I will continue to view it uh, if the amendment, um, uh, whatever happens to the amendment or the main motion. In other words, that assignment doesn't go away. You hear, you hear what I'm saying? The assignment doesn't, and I see you nodding your head. Thanks for a great, great question. Brother Greenway, and then, where did Brother Fairchild go? Okay, if you want to speak um, to our sister's question, to help the house. I think on page uh, 51, lines 15 and 16 explicitly say that we're requesting the bishop engage, engage noted and renowned United Methodist scholars from various theological traditions in this effort. This is not a monolithic view at scripture. This is a whole view for the whole church of scripture. And we're inviting the Episcopal leader of the annual conference to function within his disciplinary right and power to engage whoever the bishop wants to engage in crafting what moves forward uh, to help lead us in this effort. All right, and I promise to come to Brother Fairchild, then I'm going to come to the far side here. To answer the question, I believe that the intent and the spirit of this recommendation is to have a broad, diverse, and rich conversation. And that's something that I like about the recommendation and would support, and I do not think that there's any, um, as Jeff said, any hidden agenda no. in this. The amendment merely recognizes that this body does not have the authority to d direct the bishop. I think the bishop will exercise that authority in, in uh, faithful and fruitful ways. And this amendment merely um, does what we can do, which is to give it to a body and it recognizes in consultation with the bishop and his ordering of our life together. All right, I promise to come to the far side, then we'll come to some other sections. A blue card, number two. Hi, Jennifer Burns, um, Northwest Plains, Howard United Methodist Church clergy. Um, can I ask a question before I decide whether to speak? Um, and, and that is, uh, Daryl, can, can you tell me what line that insertion is gonna be on? Uh, line seven, oh, I'm sorry, Daryl. <laughs> Go ahead, buddy. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, line 17. And it can be on the screen. Uh, would that help you, Jennifer? Yes. And I think it'll help the whole house. Let's take just, there it is. Okay, my. Okay. Um, I, I would like to speak for this amendment. Um, and I guess what I would like to say is that we have a new bishop, and it is his role as bishop to determine what the focus is going to be in a lot of ways. As a pastor, um, if I was assigned to a new church and the church said, well, for the next four years, we want you to preach about this topic, and this is what you're going to be preaching on, um, I, I think I'd be a little taken aback by that. Um, it is my role as pastor to help facilitate and to do a lot of that exegesis. Um, and so I think expanding it to this team is a great way of saying, we're going to engage this topic as a conference, um, but we're not going to be pushing our bishop to do our bidding um, when it is his role to guide our conference. And we need to allow him the space to live into that and to use his wisdom and his call to guide our conference. And I feel like this limits the, the, his ability and his freedom to answer the spirit call in that regard. And I think that this amendment helps by moving the focus to a team that can be implementing this rather than saying this is what the bishop's focus needs to be for the next quadrennium. Thank you. All right, thank you. I promise to come to the middle with a question and then we'll see if there's conversation elsewhere in the house. Number four. Uh, Bishop, I'm Reginald Olson, uh, retired for 12 years now from the Ohio River Valley. I do want to tell people that there is life after retirement. <laughs> and I'd like to know if uh, an amendment, a friendly amendment to Daryl's amendment is in order. Let's give it a try and then we'll, um, we're on, go ahead, go ahead, give it a try. 
Okay, I'd like to suggest that on lines 9, 11, and 14, we add an S to the word interpretation. So it reads interpretations. I think that's in keeping with the spirit of the main motion and perhaps the amendment as well. Uh, do I have to get a second to this amendment to the amendment? <laughs> Well, you already have it now, so. Oh, okay, uh, so then I'd like to speak to it very briefly, if I may. Yes. Uh, I think you are correct. Um, tell me your name again, friend. Yes, Reginald Olson. All right, if you still want to come back, let us dispose in one way or another with the amendment. Fine, thank um, you. And then uh, somebody remind me, uh, uh, Randy, to come back then. We're on the Fairchild Amendment. Are you ready to uh, express yourself on that? I see a card here. Um, um, not you here, the one behind you was up first. Yeah, beyond the midway point there. Thank you. And number seven. I'm uh, Lee Saunders. I'm from the Ohio River Valley. Uh, I just have a question about the original recommendation. Is there anything in the recommendation that either enhances the ability to have this happen or prevents the ability to have this happen? I don't see that the recommendation does anything, and it's for clarification. Does it do anything that either enhances the bishop's ability or uh, keeps the bishop from doing anything that the bishop needs to do? I think you're really on the scope of the whole thing. I'd be happy to come back to you. Let's try to stick with the amendment, make a decision on that when the House is ready. And then, um, and then if you want to come back again, I'll be pleased uh, to try to, to look that way. I saw one other uh, sort of about Oh, seven or eight rows ahead of that gentleman had a question. And um, all right, I don't see you anymore. Let's come to blue. Somebody says near the rear. In the center here? I can't see it. There. Moving. Okay, all right. You're going to eight. Okay, great. I'm Gordon Brown, uh, Yellow Springs Church, Miami Valley District. Uh, I want to speak in a affirmation for Daryl's amendment. Uh, my concern wasn't so much for authority, but how do you get from the bishop's role to the local church? And there has to be some, I would think, how do we get to there? And uh, we don't like bureaucracy necessarily, but there has to be some go-between from the high calling of the resolution to how it fits in uh, to how that's gonna happen on the district or local church level. So I think uh, having you know, a task force or whatever to help it get down to where uh, it needs to be uh, so that that resolution can happen uh, more locally, I think would be helpful. I hope that uh, is an affirmation of Daryl's amendment, but that's kind of where I was when I first read the resolution. All right, friends, we're at a place where we could take a speech against if there is one. All right, um, here on this aisle, number three. And after this, we will have had two and two on the amendment. Go right ahead, friend. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, I think it's uh, not. Uh, Tell my us name, who you are, My name is Greg Herndon with uh, Capillary North. Uh, I think it's irrelevant to have the recommend the uh, amendment as much as I think it's irrelevant to have the recommendation <laughs> because of the scope of your responsibility that has already been articulated. And so, therefore, I think we need to just relax sit back and let you do your thing. <laughs> All right, we've had two for and two against. And um, are you ready to vote on the amendment? No, no, we didn't accept an amendment to the amendment. We, we... Right, yeah, the, on the Fairchild Amendment. Now, Brother Fairchild and Brother Greenway, you can speak if you wish. It's up to you. Uh, you have a right to a final speech or we can vote. I've been part of this annual conference. There have been 
conversations that this body has wanted to have. This looks like an important one. I think that uh, we should engage in this work, and I think the appropriate place to do it is with our Inclusive Body of Christ team. All right, Brother Greenway. Yeah. Uh, when I wrote this, um, the intent was to allow the bishop the latitude to engage whatever parts of the annual conference he, he chose to engage. So uh, we really leave it up to the body. It's the body's decision. All right. Thank you. Friends, are you ready? Yeah. Or do you need to see it again? All right. Let's see it one more time. And Madam Secretary, well, it's there. It's there. We don't go ahead, Amen. Don't worry about it. We'll give you just a second here. All right, my friends, if, uh, if you will adopt the amendment as you see it before you on the screen, please lift the hand now. All right, thank you. And if you oppose the amendment, please lift your hands. All right, you have not sustained the amendment. Thank you. We're on the main motion. All right. And I promised I'd come back to a brother here who tried an amendment to the amendment. And then we'll... Um, See where, see where we are. Thank you, for Thank you for remembering me, Bishop. All right, tell us again for the record who you are. Uh, what I would like to do is amend the document uh, as proposed by adding on lines 9, 11, and 14 an S to the word interpretation, just so it reads interpretations. I think this is uh, in keeping with the perspective of the recommendation. Uh, several of my colleagues have uh, shared with me some feeling that there are ulterior motives and so on and so forth. Uh, I just think that this would clarify what is being said because indeed I believe in continuing revelation. Since uh, John Wesley spoke of the book, much has been discovered about the book, and I think we need a profit from that. All right, thank you. It's, and it's, it's uh, I think, already been supported. And uh, friends, this adds an S everywhere the word interpretation uh, comes up. Um, anybody wishing to speak to that? And, and we'll turn to the, to the chair uh, of the committee. Got a question on this um, sort of center. I saw a question, okay. Um, I see somebody standing, number five, okay. Uh, my, na my name is Denny Biddinger, I'm from uh, Foothills District, just lay. In addition to the S on all those interpretations, I'm wondering if in lines 19 and 20, the author didn't mean to say authority, nature, role, and interpretations of scripture there instead of authority twice. I did, I did. That's more of a clarification. Thank you. That's a good question. Let's, we're on this amendment that would make it interpretations, and I see a red card straight ahead of me about midway back. And number, what's closest? Three? Okay. All right. Hi, I'm Susan Putt. Northwest Plains District and professor of English at Ohio Northern University. <laughs> there are two rules in our English language that do not make necessary the addition of the S on interpretation. The first is the decision to include the word individual before the listing, and the second is the rule of parallelism in a series. All right, you're speaking against the amendment. <laughs> and we're ready now for a speech for, if anybody wishes to, or perhaps the House would wish to express itself on this. Are you ready to act? Yes. All right, my friends, let's give it a try. Now you have a right to make a speech as the maker <laughs> and then the chair of the committee. Um, let me know what you wanna do and then the House has indicated it's ready to, to move. 
Well, again, my name is Reginald Olson. Someone said I should add that. And uh, I apologize uh, if my uh, English is not uh, up to par. Uh, I just returned from a trip to Spain, and uh, multilingualism has got me all confused. So. Thank you, friend. Brother Greenway, anything you need to say? I learned a long time ago not to argue with an English professor. Yeah. All right, let's give it a try, friends. And uh, then I think there's one typographical error that um, Jeff will speak to. Um, if you will support this most recent amendment that makes where the word interpretation is, adds an S to it in several places, please lift your hand now. All right. And if you oppose it, please lift your hand. All right, I don't know whether um, our grammarian took the day or um, <laughs> I, I had so much red ink on my papers as a student, so, and I'm glad we we're able to laugh. Now, you have one correction, which is merely typographical. That's correct, line we'll 20, uh, the word should be interpretation rather than authority on page 51. All right, and uh, uh, in, uh, the line 20. 20. All right. We are on the main motion, which has not um, been amended. I see near number four against. John Edgar, Capital Area South. I, I rise to speak against for a couple of reasons. Uh, first is to repeat part of what was in some of the earlier dialogue. I think this is not necessary. I believe that um, the bishop has already read the appropriate section from the discipline. The bishop has the authority to teach us in any way the bishop uh, sees fit, and I welcome that and look forward to it. Secondly, if we really were to pick a quadrennial theme, uh, there's some others that I'd be more interested in. I'm interested in radical hospitality, discipleship. I'm interested in what it means for us to look seriously at ourselves and where we may need to repent and change so that we can be better servants of God. There are a lot of things we could be talking about for a quadrennial theme. But there, more than anything else, what motivated me to want to stand and speak was the illustration of a quarter. It's what troubled me when I first read this. You know, when um, the maker of the motions asked our bishop to look at the quarter on one side, and then, then he looked at it the other and said it's heads. Well, the problem is, if you look at an issue as heads and tails, you toss the coin, somebody wins, somebody loses. That is not the Bible I love and I am concerned about. I do not want to engage in a process that could end up being divisive when we do not need it. I believe we can allow the bishop to decide what the bishop wants to teach us about Holy Scripture. And I think we're better served to continue the spirit of this annual conference, which I think is remarkable. It is welcoming. It is a spirit that says we are all in this together. I don't think we need to do this, so I speak against it. Thank you. All right, I'm looking for if there's a blue card or if you have readiness to act, friends. Blue card, tell me where I'm looking here. Right, okay, right by number four, all right. Number four. Rod Brower, Foothills District, clergy. I am gonna request that you support this resolution because it etches out time to allow the bishop to meet throughout the conference with laity and clergy alike and any other person that would like to come and listen. As Dr. Robinson reminded us this morning, some of us are Saturday evening sermon writers because of the busyness of our days. And this allows for that time to be set aside, intentional. And I, uh, I would give myself the opportunity to come and hear the bishop teach on the authority of scripture, realizing that uh, he would invite me to disagree with, with me as to in front of me in the front section. No. Robin Rader, Capital Area North Clergy. Bishop, what do you think of this? <laughs> Rader. <laughs> uh, 
I think I, I better resist the temptation to enter into the debate. I've, um, when asked, and I will remind you of that, the record will indicate, I tried to respond a bit, not exhaustively, about how I understood parts of the job that the church has so generously given to me. And um, I, I got on my knees in Middleton, Wisconsin, 13 years ago, and took a vow to do that job. So I think I'm, I'm not going to say uh, kind of in the realm of um, I like, I dislike, etc. cetera. Um, but thanks for, thanks for honoring me by, by asking, and I do feel honored. Uh, friends, this is in your hands, and we're, um, are you ready to express yourself on the whole thing? You want to give it a try? Let's turn to the, oh, I'm sorry. I, didn't, I couldn't see you in the light. The light blinded me. Tell me the number. Number seven. Okay. All right. Jane Madden, Miami Valley clergy. Uh, just for clarification, line 12, mm -hmm. should not that be the word it instead of in? Where is it? Tell, so, Madam Secretary, tell yes. us what the correction is. On page uh, 51, line 12, it would say, therefore, be it resolved. Okay. It'd be an editorial correction. I think that's editorial that okay, and we don't Jeff? need to vote. And yeah. I saw another colored card. Somebody was pointing over. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, you can come to uh, two, three, or the front. They're all about equidistant to you. Number two, uh, he's going to. Okay, great. Where is number two? Okay, I see it now. Yeah, I get nervous when I get up front, so I decided to come over here. I'm Ben Ward from uh, Maumee uh, Watershed. I view this as something, or the concern I have is that it's like a bill in the Senate. We take a little bit now, and then later we take a little bit more. I feel that it's not necessary because we can do this without formalizing it. And I feel that the next step might be, well, Whatever comes out of this, two annual conferences from now, becomes part of the book of resolutions. And then, even further down, several annual conferences, it's like, you've got to believe this and only this. And that would get away from what the intent of this resolution is. So I'm all in favor of having dialogue but not formalizing it to the point that it can become dictatorial. All right, thank you. We can, I can look for a blue card or we can see if you want to vote. I see a blue card here on this aisle here, number three. All right. And then we will have had two and two, and then you'll let me know if you're ready to act. My name is Lowell Bassett, mm -hmm. Hilliard Church. Capital Area South. This connects with efforts I have made in the past toward an open-mindedness toward additional truths. Truth is a part of the characteristic of our Christ, of Jesus. We should not be afraid when new truths are discovered and expressed. I hope we will pass the resolution. All right, friend. We've had two and two. Would you like to vote? All right, let's give it a try. And uh, let's, um, I'm gonna turn to the maker of the, um, of the motion. And, um, and then we'll have uh, uh, a brief prayer and then we'll vote. Brother Greenway. Thank you, Bishop. Um, with all due respect, this is not about trying to instruct our bishop what to do. It's really asking our bishop to help us, 
to have conversation together. Earlier this year, I've been in a couple of different places where it's been very clear that we don't understand how to talk with each other around our common book. And, uh, and we're just, I'm, the intent of this is to ask for Episcopal help to help us with that conversation. I encourage you to vote for it. Thank you very much. Um, some of you that uh, know me uh, know that, um, and you, and more of you will know me after this these days. Um, know that um, I have a, a deep appreciation for the hymns, uh, the hymn tradition of the Christian faith, and and of which um, uh, our movement has contributed mightily. And um, so I want to pray, uh, as I do sometimes, out of the hymns. And I'm happy to keep my eyes wide open. In the hymn that is entitled, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind, in our hymnal, you will um, find these words beginning in uh, verse 3. O Sabbath rest by Galilee, O calm of hills above, where Jesus knelt to share with thee the silence of eternity interpreted by love. Verse 4 says, drop thy still dews of quietness till all our strivings cease. Take from our souls the strain and stress, and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. Verse 5 says and prays, breathe through the heats of our desire, thy coolness and thy balm. Let sense be dumb, let flesh retire. Speak through the earthquake, wind and fire. O oh, still small voice of calm. I pray that often and I invite you to, uh, in your prayer life, give attention to hymns that pray because as our Jewish sisters and brothers would say, uh, the ones who sing pray twice a day. We're on the motion as it's been presented. If you will adopt recommendation seven, please lift your hand now. All right, thank you. If you oppose recommendation seven, please lift your hand now. Lord, have mercy upon us. Uh, let's try a stand, and uh, as you are able, and if you're not able, um, try to try to wave um, so we can pick it up. Um, if you favor recommendation seven, express that by standing, please. Let's, uh, let's uh, have our seats, and uh, if you oppose Recommendation 7, uh, please stand. Uh, I, I believe you have not adopted Recommendation 7. Thank you, Brother Greenway. Yeah. Oh, I hear a voice, but see, okay. Yeah. Oh, sure, sure, I'm happy to do that. Uh, give me just a moment. Let me get the, uh, our ushers, I believe, are our tellers. And um, so let them get in their places. Let's give them at least 60 seconds to do that. And we'll do this by standing again. And they will come through and count your row and then give you a signal to be seated after they've counted your row. Does that make sense? You, you've done this before, yeah. And make sure you're in the bar of the conference.
there's no tellers on this aisle yet. Are you there? Are there going to be any here? You're doing that one. Okay. All right. They're still moving. Okay. They're still moving. All right. There's a guy right by there. Yeah, His name's Greg Creech. <laughs> Greg Creech. Now, the tellers are our friends in, they are also our ushers in the orange vests. And um, before you vote, I want you to give them some love. Yeah. yeah. They have served us generously and faithfully, and we're grateful. Now, to those in the orange vests, if you're ready, wave your hands, the, the, the tellers. I want to make sure uh, we don't end up in 10 minutes discussing where somebody counted. Okay, great. All right. If you favor recommendation seven, please stand until an usher gives you a signal to sit. And just so you know where we're going, um, when they get through taking the count on both sides, they need some tallying time because here in West Ohio, we do this manually. And um, I'm just saying. Um, and um, um, so what we will do then is move to our next item and then hear back the results before we adjourn for lunch. I'm trying to make best use of our time. We've got a luncheon for our retiring class, etc. today, okay? All right, Nick. Now, we still have a few more on the pro side. All right, we, we, we have the time you need. Tellers, if you're done, wave at me so I know you're done with that side of the question. Okay, I see a few more people still standing. Okay, that's fine. All right, and you've been a most patient house. You, you, you can. All right, looks like the last row. All right, now if you oppose uh, recommendation seven, please stand and then the same process will be used.
I'm just trying to get a sense from the tellers. Wave, wave when you're done, tellers. All right. I don't see any tellers not waving, and I want to make sure everyone's vote is counted. Thank you, friends. We'll, that'll be tabulated manually, and then we'll get it up to the desk by the time we break for lunch. And um, I think I'm calling on Brother George Cooper and a cast of friends uh, to help us with a presentation on imaginal malaria. Where's Brother George? Oh, there he is. Okay. Bishop Palmer and um, members of the annual conference, I'm back. <laughs> As I prepare for my remarks, our ushers will begin to, um, after they've done their count, they'll begin to pass out some materials to you. Um, I'm a math physics major. Don't be impressed. Um, I didn't do that well in that course. I do better at raising money. Uh, <laughs> but um, one of the things as a math physics major that I struggle with sometimes is the English language and finding the right words. And in this annual conference, I don't know how to sufficiently say thank you to you. I believe in saying thank you times 10, but I don't have time for that. And words are insufficient to express my gratitude for the generous stewards of this annual conference. Late yesterday afternoon, you were recognized for your generosity by the General Board of Global Missions when George Howard presented an award to the West Ohio Annual Conference for his general support of the advance in a year when connectional giving was increasing as well. This generosity reflects the support of many national and global missions. In this report, we, we focus on a movement in this annual conference that began years ago that has spanned caring for an individual to caring for a conference to caring for a continent. In 2010, this annual conference provided 15,600 nets for nothing but nets. 191 donors, including churches and individuals, gave through the Council on Development $155,000, which provided nets to improve the health of 15,000 families. Last year in 2012, this annual conference gave and committed $1,050,000. Our goal was 500, you will remember, to the Wings of the Morning Caravan campaign. Last month, we not only saw the plane, but we celebrated and blessed it with Gaston to send him into mission to the people specifically in the North Katanga Conference in the Congo. In partnership with other annual conferences and churches, over two million was raised. Imagine the people saved through an air ambulance, delivery of medicine, resources for clinics, and the thousands of individuals introduced to the good news of Jesus Christ enabling the North Katanga Conference to be one of the fastest growing United Methodist Conferences on the globe. That's worth an applause, yes. And you're a part of it. Now move to a vision that has a much bigger and broader scope. I know you're familiar with imaginal malaria, but you have thus far heard very little on how to respond. Honestly, that's intentional. There is no miracle offering this year, it's a launch offering. For an initiative for the West Ohio Conference to partner with other annual conference to eradicate deaths by the disease of malaria on the continent of Africa. While gifts are immensely appreciated, peripheral discernment of you and your church's sacrificial involvement is of even greater significance. You've been given an 
Imagine no malaria response card that is provided in the back of your program guide, and I encourage you to take it back to your cottage in your room this evening and spend time in prayerful consideration to bring it back with you tomorrow morning. Ask us questions in the tent that's just outside the door about Imagine No Malaria and how your church can participate. But most importantly, it's time to get me off the podium and introduce those who can best... Thanks a lot. Thanks. <laughs> it's got to be a comedian in every group, right? <laughs> um, I want to introduce to you those that can best share the story. Our own Bishop Palmer. Um, Ashley Gish from the Imagine No Malaria, who is the field um, coordinator for Imagine No Malaria. And of course, uh, Michael Slaughter and Paul Reisler, who will be sharing with you as well. So I move out of the way. Bishop. Thank you, Brother George. Dear friends, um, I, those of you, I used this phrase earlier that know me know um, that I am excited about Imagine No Malaria. And I know one of the things that happens in our digital and connected and socially networked world is that uh, people kind of look behind the scenes to see what you've done before. So I'm already on the record as having made a deep commitment uh, in terms of my leadership uh, to Imagine No Malaria. I've been on the executive team of the Global Health Initiative in terms of the steering committee, and in a previous life, uh, not so long ago, I invited an annual conference to raise at least $2.3 million for Imagine No Malaria. When I left there in late August, they were at $2 million, and uh, just this spring, I got an email that said, uh, the check has come in that has pushed the Illinois Great Rivers Conference across the finish line of the $2.3 million. <clears throat> now I say that not because I'm living in some storied past, but to underscore the level of commitment that I have to this, having traveled throughout the annual conference, met with groups large and small, met with individual donors of great capacity, met with groups of young people who ran lemonade stands and car washes because they wanted to contribute to eradicating deaths due to malaria by the year 2015. I'm passionate about this because I am already convinced that the work that we sort of first got tuned into around this aggressive goal uh, with uh, which we are partnered with lots of folks on um, really took life in our own church with nothing but nets. And then we had the chance to brand this to say, what would our effort over a longer period of time as a denomination be that would really bring a multi-phased health platform into communities, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, look like? And it was so rebranded, Imagine No Malaria for us. And so I'm passionate about this because it represents a long-term systemic commitment and intervention. And what I have seen in Sierra Leone, in Nigeria, in uh, Liberia, and in other nations on the continent of Africa where I have visited because of mission partnerships and because of this campaign is that I have seen that it opens a door to help us move the clock so that there are fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer deaths due to malaria, particularly in children under five and women. And that when people come to the clinics that reach a, a certain level of competency are then uh, assigned and the health boards uh, says that this clinic can do this kind of work, that people who come bringing a sick and feverish child and then who moves into the chills because they have malaria or an adult comes with the aid of someone else. I have seen with my own eyes that not only is malaria addressed in the life of that person or persons and those families, but then the opportunity exists in order to invite people to tend to other health needs that they may have. For example, a pregnant mom bringing a little feverish and chill child, but who is showing physically in her pregnancy when the malaria is addressed in that child, the nurse or the nurse practitioner then has the opportunity to say, are you on prenatal vitamins? 
So a door opens. This is about eliminating deaths due to malaria, but it opens the door to so much more that allows there to be access to education, treatment, and prevention. Now finally this for this time uh, up at the podium. I get reawakened every time I travel on the continent of Africa when I am instructed upon my arrival. Now, Bishop, when you go to bed tonight, be sure to let your bed net down around you. So what I take for granted that has been resolved in terms of our daily experience in much of the Western world relative to the mosquitoes that carry the virus and being up close and personal and getting malaria here, because the chances are slim, is that when I'm there, I have to be more conscious of prevention. I have to take prophylactic medicine in order to work on the inside, and I pull the net down at night on the outside, and sometimes I put something on my skin and I wear long sleeve shirts Etc., etc. And on the small but possible chance that I were to be bitten by the wrong mosquito and to contract malaria, I still take for granted that it can be diagnosed, it can be assessed, and I can be treated. And the likelihood that it's going to take me out is like slim and none. What I want and expect, and as ashamed as I am just of this, that I feel entitled to it, I want that same kind of access. Prevention, education, treatment for more and more of God's children around this preventable and Heaven forbid you should contract it, treatable disease. Hello, I feel so blessed that Bishop, that you have invited me and that all of you have invited me to be here in this beautiful place to share a little bit with you. As they shared, I am the field coordinator specialist for Imagine No Malaria, and I'm here just to tell you that we as United Methodists are telling a story. We're telling a story that in some parts of the world there's a tiny mosquito with a microscopic parasite that kills. But we're also telling the story that deaths of millions, including many children under the age of five, do not and did not need to happen. We are making a bold choice. Me, you, your families, your friends, your church families, we are taking the choice now to look at that bag of gourmet coffee, that fast food lunch, that shirt sitting there on the clearance rack. We are looking at those things and we are saying, for the cost of something that means so little to me, I can do so much for someone else. You may never know who that someone else is. It could be a five-year-old girl excited for her first day of school, a young man who is caring for his family and working hard to see that they live a happy and comfortable life. It may be an expectant mother excited to bring her firstborn child into this world. Nine other United Methodist conferences across the country have taken the challenge to lead the way in the evolution of Nothing But Nets, an initiative that we saw uh, that was a purchase for a simple bed net, a purchase for prevention. We are evolving now into Imagine No Malaria, a ministry that doesn't just stop at prevention with a simple bed net purchase. Imagine No Malaria does far more. As you heard from Bishop, Imagine No Malaria works to prevent malaria through using nets, but also through encouraging communities to clear standing water and brush around their homes. We diagnose with rapid diagnostic kits. We treat with readily available and appropriate medication. 
We educate, and this is what I think might be the central keystone of the work we do. We educate local, trusted community healthcare workers, people who are friends, families, neighbors, aunts and uncles, and cousins of the people that they are working with. We train them to go out and to fight malaria right there in their own communities. They do this through a, comprehens a comprehensive approach of treatment, <laughs> clean water, prenatal and infant health care. And while they're doing this, they have an impact far greater. We've seen an impact not only on malaria, but malnutrition, tuberculosis, and even HIV AIDS. Furthermore, we train and empower health boards in each conference where we go and work, giving them the skills they need to write grant proposals and manage projects. This means that we're leaving behind a sustainable public health framework that will see our efforts multiplied for years to come. Imagine No Malaria is truly one of the effective and positive ways that our United Methodist Church is ministering to the poor. Malaria is truly a disease of poverty. But it's not only changing lives 8,000 miles away. Imagine no malaria, we've seen it increase congregational vitality right here stateside. Congregations all across the United States, many for the first time, are seeing their faithful action ripple not only within their four walls, but throughout the entire world. We're bringing advocacy and education to our communities and to our legislators who battle daily with the budget decisions that could, put, could very well put global health spending on the line. As one of my friends who is a lay servant in Nebraska put it, the connectional ministry that is happening through Imagine No Malaria is touching and connecting lives across the world. The United Methodist Church is showing its roots. This is what it looks like to be United Methodist. Through Imagine No Malaria, we United Methodists have set visionary goals. We've taken risks. And we've united as one in a partnership with other global health partners in this historic endeavor. One of those partners that we have in this fight is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The Bill and, Bill and Melinda Gates believe strongly in the United Methodist Church, and they have asked us to be partners in ending death from malaria. They came to our church because of our over 200 years of experience in ministering in public health. We have over 300 local health care facilities right on the continent of Africa. We're prepared for this work. They came to us because of our reputation for delivery, accountability, and sustainability following international and domestic disasters. They came to us because we'll get the job done. As a lay person in our church, I am so proud to be a United Methodist Church, or to be a United Methodist in this moment, and to know that our church is vital we're visionary, and that we are hard at work every day making disciples of Jesus Christ. So then, the entire Imagine No Malaria team comes here to you today, and we invite you to stand and take action toward ending death from malaria. It's something we know that we can do. There are resources and expertise to, to assist you. As you heard, we have a table outside and you also received handouts that give some great information about the work that we have done, the work that we're doing, and the extraordinary progress that we've had in just the three short years that we've been engaged in Imagine No Malaria. I'll tell you as a point of information that when we started Imagine No Malaria in 2010, we sadly had to report that the life of a child was lost every 30 seconds. I stand here before you today telling you that we still lose far too many lives to malaria, but we can now proudly proclaim that in three and a half years, we have cut malaria's impact in half. We now lose a life every 60 seconds.
So there are 17 other United Methodist conferences prepared to join hands with you and to take this incredible journey. And nine others have walked before you. This is truly something that we are doing as an entire church. Before I show you a quick, a quick snapshot and video of Imagine No Malaria and our accomplishments in just a short time, I want to share with you a scripture that guides me and that guides the whole Imagine No Malaria team daily as we continue our supportive work and support conferences just like yours across the United States. It's from Ephesians 3. Perhaps you're familiar with it. I pray that Christ Jesus and the church will forever bring praise to God. His power at work in us can do more immeasurable more than we dare ask or even imagine. Dear friends, uh, I have the privilege of talking briefly with two of our colleagues. I've always wanted to be on TV, and uh, now I am. And, uh, but uh, Pastor Paul Reisler and Pastor Mike Slaughter, who are well known to all of you in the life of our annual conference, come from churches where they are prepared to lead those congregations uh, in raising uh, substantive amounts of money for Imagine No Malaria. And so I wanted to ask you, uh, pastors, um, how did the Holy Spirit work in you and your leadership team, your congregation, uh, to say this is a train we want to get on called Imagine No Malaria? Go ahead, That's brother. Right. You want me to go first? We, uh, we've been deeply involved, Gingersburg Church has been deeply involved in Africa and Sudan specifically in uh, building schools, water projects, and agriculture. And uh, so immediately Africa, when I hear more people die every year in Africa still from malaria than all of the people who have died, Americans who have died in war since World War I. Also, I needed a little help though. Bishop Dick called me about a year and a half ago, said, uh, Mike, we need you to help get involved in this. And you know, I put it on the back burner because we're all already doing stuff. And uh, then when you came here, you started talking about it. The Holy Spirit, you know, the Holy Goose. <laughs> And, and uh, uh, then my wife and I uh, watched an HBO special about two months ago called Mary and Martha with Hilary Swank. I really recommend that you get that and show in your church. I looked at her and I said, Carolyn, we're supposed to get involved in this in a major way. And uh, I called you and had lunch with you, and uh, that's kind of how the Holy Spirit is led. Yeah. How about in Athens at Central Church? We've always been wanted to make sure that we're praying the right prayer. I think in the church today, a lot of Christians are praying the sort of Star Trek prayer, which is beam me up, Scotty. Uh, God, get me out of here so I can go up there, as opposed to what Jesus taught us to pray, which is not get me out of here so I can go up there, but make what's going on up there go on down here. And so we've been trying to find partnerships where that vision can become a reality. And the Holy Spirit spoke in a little vo lower voice to us. It was through George Cooper. Um, I always expected the Holy Spirit to sound like maybe a British woman or James Earl Jones or something like that, but it, it was George. <laughs> and George called us up actually last year and we had made a significant commitment to drill water wells in India for a period of time. And I just said, we just started this. We have a period of time we're doing this. I can't make the commitment, but call me back next year. And he called and said, would you consider this? And I'm like, 
were on. For us, George's call wasn't a prompt to pray. He said, will you pray about this? And I'm like, it's not a prompt to pray. It's actually an answer to prayer. It was just a way to confirm that. Great. So um, for lots of churches out here among the lay and clergy members that, where they, they come from to annual conference are going to be smaller in size and at least perceived capacity than either of your churches. And I recognize you don't have the same size congregations. What would you say to them about this as a can-do opportunity, whether or not you're small, medium, large, etc.? I discovered back in 1982, our total budget was $38 thousand dollars our annual budget at Kingsburg Church and I started something called Christmas is not your birthday where money doesn't come out of your budget but whatever people spend at Christmas they bring an equal amount for a project and it was famine in Ethiopia and uh, I got a world vision film or something and with a 16 millimeter projector and the little two-room country chapel that was Ginghamsburg showed that and that Christmas our, now remember our whole budget is 38,000 36,000, the people brought $18,000 for famine relief in Ethiopia. And what I discovered is money doesn't follow church budgets, follow, money follows vision, money follows mission. Yeah. All right, great. Paul? Well, for those of us who are in churches smaller than Ginghamsburg, which is all of us. <laughs> I think, I think the first thing, those of us who are in particularly smaller to medium-sized churches, our tendency is to say, well, you know, that's Gingsburg. But first, I think we need to say to Gingsburg and to Mike, well done, good and faithful servants. Mike, Mike has built such a culture of generosity in Gingsburg Church over the years that has led the way for us. But I don't have 5,000 people. I've got a few hundred people. And God has just asked me to be faithful where I am with what I've got. Mm -hmm. And that's true for all of us. God has just asked us to be faithful where we are with what we've got. Amen. Thanks so much. So um, final question for you guys. Uh, you're prepared to lead your congregations toward what goal in that context? I'll go for we, malaria. <laughs> for, I, I want to say, too, reminder that when I went to Ginghamsburg, and I never left Ginghamsburg, the whole budget was 27000 And it was acts of this, doing beyond what we thought was possible, that would cause us to have to trust God and pray. Uh, so we are making a commitment towards Imagine No Malaria of $1 million. All right. Amen. We are not making a commitment of $1 million to Imagine No Malaria. No, that's it. Yeah. Um, George specifically called and gave us the number of 25000 uh, over the next three years. And given the other commitments that we're doing, we said that we could do that. Now I'm going to throw Mike's hand because Mike leaned over to me and said, I'm going to make you double that. And I thought, I'm going to make him double it. <laughs> We, Go ahead. We, we all, we all have commitments that we're in. Yep. Yeah. And things that we're doing, and I think that God asks you again to be faithful with where you are Absolutely. and what you've got. And, uh, be, but because of Mike's uh, challenge, we're going to raise it to thirty-five thousand. All right. So just for that. Praise the Lord. Yeah. So. So, friends, I want to say to you, because we need to uh, move on now, uh, thanks to these colleagues for kind of being uh, uh, upfront and personal about what they're prepared to offer leadership around in their congregations and in the life of our annual conference. I think there are huge implications, not only for us in West Ohio, but because of their connectedness and respect throughout the church, uh, leadership that they're going to be offering by stepping up in this way as they've stepped up previously. Uh, to other churches around our connection, but particularly here in the U.S. So here's, here's what I'm dreaming about, and here's what I'm imagining. Remember, I talked about my former life, and I said, well, surely. I mean, you guys did last year in advance giving what I did just in one campaign for Imagine No Malaria. So I said, surely. 
the West Ohio Annual Conference, might join me in dreaming and working toward a commitment and a goal of at least three and a half million dollars. So that's your bishop's hope and your bishop's prayer, and that's what I'm gonna be giving some of my time and energy to across the next several years. We're gonna inundate you with resources in print and on the web and uh, help any local congregation to have an imaginative approach to this. And whether or not it comes in a Christmas is not your birthday offering, whether or not you add it as a percentage of a capital campaign for your building, all of these are illustrations of things that have been done. My goal is for every congregation in this conference to engage because I believe if all nearly 1,100 congregations in this annual conference engage, three and a half million dollars is easily beyond just the scope of our imagination of my burning passion and dream it is within our grasp for the reign of God and anything we do that goes beyond that will only bless more people and remember that clock we want to keep it moving so we're from 30 to 60 seconds what if we moved it in this annual conference with our gifts so it's every minute and a half a child in Africa dies from malaria. Let the church say amen. amen. Would you pray with me? And uh, as um, we're ready to move to our courtesies and announcements, and, um, uh, but let's pray just about this opportunity. Loving God, for the life you've given us in Jesus Christ and life abundant that we've heard so much about even today, and for a vision to see a world made new spiritually and physically, we give you thanks and praise. To that end of participating in your transforming love and power and abundant life gift to others in body and in spirit that Imagine No Malaria represents. We offer ourselves to you. We're at different places on that journey, individually and in our congregations. But we pray that you will increase, enlarge our vision and our capacity and help us to connect in life-saving, life-transforming ways so that the message sent is that in the name of Jesus, we offer you life a life that is touched by the power of the cross, a life that is free from the threat of malaria. It is in the name of the Lord Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. All right, Madam Secretary, you have an announcement for us on our ballot, and I promised you that before lunch. And um, then, um, is Terry here? She's ready to go. Okay, good. <coughs> The secretary's mic, please. The votes were as follows, four, 640, against 788. So the record. The Lord be with you. It's good to be before you again. I have a few announcements. Please have, give us a little bit of your attention today. A reminder to you that tomorrow, Wednesday, there will be two children family fun events, uh, the putt-putt golf outing at 10 a.m. and a family worship experience in the gazebo at 11 a.m. A reminder that today over our lunch hour, our Chancellor Phil Moots will be holding free consultations in the Lakeside office. So if you have any question, a legal question you'd like to talk with him about, he'd be happy to help you. And he does a very good job with helping our churches. Reminder that there is a screen in the back. If you have personal announcements, please don't hesitate to put those there. Um, we've had um, a couple of other announcements. The Black Methodists for Church Renewal, BMCR, will meet tonight at 8, 8 p.m. in the Green Room at the Fountain Inn. A reminder that the Methodist Federation for Social Action, MFSA, is meeting at noon today in the Green Room. Uh, we have a couple of folks. Oh, we want you to know the campers. This is the first week of camp this year, Bishop. All of our campers and the and the leaders are going there. So let's keep them keep them in our prayers this week. The United Methodist camps. 
Vicki Rader uh, asked us to uh, pray for her, her niece who had a serious asthma attack and is very critical. Her name is Holly and she may not make it. Uh, Dennis Baker is, uh, Pastor Dennis Baker is recovering very well from uh, open heart surgery today, so we want to remember him. And you know, every once in a while, um, there's a birthday that's pretty significant. Many of you here today is, have had, are having birthdays this week. But when someone reaches a certain um, level of youth, I think it's good to acknowledge that um, Mrs. Billy Hodges, who's the lay member from Toledo West, the UMC, and the daughter of the Reverend Weverly Early, is 85 years old today. Is she here? I think so, I don't know where. If you are here, would you stand? Is she in here now? She's in the back. Oh. God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Please remember to clear Hoover immediately and take your belongings with you. There will be a rehearsal at, uh, immediately following this session. And don't forget Rock to Dock, Rock the Dock at 10 p.m. near the dock tonight. And I think we have a little video. Is it 8? Okay, my list is wrong. 8 p.m. Uh, tonight, and if you'd like to get a little teaser for that, I think we have a video ready, do we? Ohio River Valley sees their district superintendent a new light. I invite President Kathy Crindle to please come and, and uh, talk to us about Otterbein and whatever's on her heart today, and she will be dismissing us in our prayer for lunch. Uh, hello, Madam President. Uh, hello. Right here. Madam President, thank you for being here. And before you come, because you're going to end with prayer, don't go anywhere. I want to say to this house, thank you for being in excellent order. And we will reconvene at 2 p.m. So you have adequate time <laughs> for everything to cover our bit of going over time this morning. Is that all right with you? 2 p.m., all right? Thank you, Bishop Palmer, and um, welcome. I'm very happy to be here and to join all of the members of the West Ohio Annual Conference. I realize that we're running a little bit behind, um, and I also understand that I stand between you and lunch. Um, so I promise to be brief, but I want to give you a little bit of food for thought that you can sort of chew over as you enjoy your lunch and keep Otterbein on your mind for more than just a few minutes that I will be addressing you this morning. So I bring you warm greetings from Otterbein University, and I greatly appreciate the opportunity to join you here in this beautiful place to celebrate the serenity, the restoration, and the affirmation associated with the traditions of, of Lakeside. Let me set the stage for my comments by citing just a brief passage from Otterbein's history. When our institution was founded in 1847, the trustees of the college voted on the name Otterbein University of Ohio. And perhaps that was a bit aspirational with just a handful of students um, standing on the site of our college to be. Daniel Hurley's history of Otterbein notes at the time, the trustees had no plans for a university in the modern sense of the word. In fact, he said, they had only the vaguest idea about what even a college might be. What they had was a grand dream. And in the 1840s, America spawned and nurtured such dreams. Otterbein's founders always intended to mold the entire person, not just the mind, says Hurley. In fact, the college catalog of 1853 read, we have attempted to mark out a course of study which will best tend to produce strong, accurate thinkers, diligent students, and practical men and women. Practical in every sense of the word with regard to both temporal and eternal interest in themselves and in the world. 
That commitment to educating the whole person, both the temporal and the eternal, remains fundamental to an Otterbein education. In fact, when we reviewed our institutional mission statement this past year, the phrase of educating the whole person was unanimously supported as a critical component of that statement. From current students to faculty members to alumni and trustees, the concept of focusing not simply on the temporal but the eternal was embraced as a defining and distinguishing characteristic of the Otterbein experience. We think about the Otterbein experience in this way. Our students prepare through their programs of study, that is through the curriculum, to lead their professions, whether that's as nurses or doctors or teachers or professors or as business men and women and so on. But they also prepare through their Otterbein experiences outside the classroom to understand and appreciate the importance and value of service to others, of engaging as members of a larger community. From the very first day our students step foot on campus, they are expected to participate in community service. Their first Saturday morning on campus, we greet the freshmen at our campus center and we take them out into the community as volunteers working together to serve those in need. This commitment to community service is a continuing expectation throughout their undergraduate experience. They are scholars in the classroom, but they are servants to their community in fulfilling what we refer to as their cardinal experiences over the course of four years at Otterbein. Each year, Audubon continues to be recognized as one of the leading institutions in the entire country through our students' commitment to serving others. These students contribute more than 70,000 hours of volunteer service each year to community organizations, nonprofits, schools, and social agencies throughout Central Ohio. But let me be a bit more specific about the ways in which community engagement is directly tied to our relationship with the United Methodist Church and its service mission through our student organizations. The number of such groups continues to grow at Otterbein. They include the Otterbein Christian Fellowship, Habitat for Humanity, the Gospel Choir, the John Paul II Society, Athletes in Action, and Crossroads, which is a joint effort with Church of the Master United Methodist. All of these groups demonstrate their faith through serving others. Just to give you some sense of the work these students are doing, we celebrated Otterbein's fifth year of hosting the Festival of Sharing on our campus last fall. This year's efforts filled a 53-foot semi-truck with disaster relief kits, and that's a lot of disaster relief kits. Several student organizations assisted with other church world service activities and projects, including building cold frames to start community gardens for those in need in partnership with Jackson Area Ministries. In fact, it is two Otterbein alumni who lead the church world service offices in Central Ohio as the director and assistant director of that organization. They serve as role models for our current students in fulfilling their life's mission. An Otterbein Habitat for Humanity dream team of 14 students traveled to Avery County, North Carolina during spring break for the Collegiate Challenge Alternative Spring Break trip. They arrived with only the foundation of the house done, but when they left at the end of the week, the walls were up and it was ready for roofing. In addition, each year, these student groups organize and lead an inspiring baccalaureate service to give our graduating seniors a meaningful opportunity to reflect on the ways in which their Otterbein experience has provided opportunities for their spiritual growth as well as their academic and professional development. But beyond our spiritual connections to the church, there are also strong ties through relationships to our home churches, Church of the Master and Church of the Messiah. I just want to mention that Pastor Jim Wilson and I both serve as members of the Westerville Area Resource Ministry, WARM as we like to call it, where our students volunteer to provide a community garden that provides fresh produce for the food pantry that WARM operates. Jim and I work together to make sure that there's a strong partnership that reaches beyond the boundaries of the Otterbein campus and well into the community as our students work side by side with volunteers from WARM. And thanks to the leadership of, the, of Reverend Todd Anderson, our students enjoy regular spaghetti dinners and late night breakfasts. I just want to mention that the Church of the Master, uh, our wonderful uh, congregation friends, volunteer well into the night during final exams to make sure that our, our students have pancakes with all the fixins. They serve from 11 at night to 1 in the morning. And then there's cleanup, and we have plenty of help in doing so. At the spaghetti dinners, we routinely serve more than 600 students in one evening. 
So those relationships that take us out into the community through our partnerships with our, our local churches, our home churches, is, is instrumental to our success as an institution as well, and taking the students beyond our campus. And I suppose the final news that I have to share with you is that Reverend Monty Bradley, whom many of you know, will be retiring after 30 years of service to Otterbein. The Board of Trustees voted to give Monty emeritus status, the highest honor in the academic community. We will miss his leadership greatly. As you know, replacing a religious leader of such long-time service and commitment is challenging, and we are very thankful for the support and guidance of Bishop Palmer. He has extended his helping hand to Otterbein as we prepare to work through this transition, and we look forward to his leadership and many other forms of partnership. So let me give you your food for thought over lunch. Remember this about Otterbein. While many things have changed throughout the years, Otterbein has remained true to its founding values and its historic mission, our commitment to educating the whole person, both the temporal and the eternal, in the words of our founders. Our graduates are individuals who will make us all proud in their service to their professions, but also through their engagement in their communities. They are leaders who aspire to serve the common good. There is important work ahead for Otterbein, and I look forward to sharing more of that news with you in the future. Otterbein has quietly but honorably set the pace as a leader in higher education since its founding, and we continue to do so. And that commitment to contributing to the common good, coupled with our historic core values and our spiritual foundation, is what will enable us to continue to distinguish our institution in the 21st century. Thank you for the opportunity to share our good news with you this morning, and thank you for you con your continued dedication and leadership. And now, as we prepare to recess for lunch, please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to come together in your name today. We express our gratitude for all of the many blessings we have received. Thank you for the gift of leadership that you have bestowed upon the members of this conference. Guide and protect them as they reflect on your word and your will today and always. We pray for strength to meet the challenges that we face today, as well as those that we will encounter down the road. Grant us patience, understanding, generosity, and wisdom in all that we think, in all that we say, and in all that we do. Amen. Thank you, Madam President. Dear friends, you've been great. We'll see you at 2 o'clock.